Okay. Uh, well, welcome to the special purpose operating system community meeting. Um, this week, uh, we have just the, uh, uh, we'll be doing a presentation and introduction to Bob Rocket. Uh, and then the agenda is open. So if anybody else has anything else they would like to add, uh, we, we've got time and be great to talk about some other things. Um, I guess we could start off with the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Sean McGinnis. Uh, I work for AWS. Uh, I'm one of the engineers on the Bile Rocket uh, project, and I'll be uh, helping out with the presentation today. Uh, anybody else that would like to uh, introduce themselves, go ahead. If you don't feel like it, that's fine. Uh, whatever we'll start. I'm, I'm Kyle from the Bottle Rocket Project. Hi, uh, I'm Dimitris. I, I work for Spectre Cloud on the Kairos project. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Hi, I'm Tilo. Um, I am with the Flatcar project. And um, in, in our office hours, we have this pattern of everybody introduces themselves and then picks the next person. So we prevent this. Uh, awkward uh, quietness. We do that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sean, yeah. No, others are doing that. Okay, it's common practice then. <laughs> yeah. Sean, you're next. Who are you? <laughs> Good. Yeah. Next time we'll have to do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. I don't have the. Is there anybody? Oh, Matt. Uh, yeah, Matt. If you would like to introduce yourself, if not, that's fine. Whatever you're comfortable with. Sure. Hopefully my audio is working. Hi, I'm Matt Yezel. I'm on the Bottle Rocket team. So uh, this is my first time joining. I just scrambled in at the last second. So I'm happy to be here and see what it's all about. Awesome. And I see Justin just joined, if you would like to introduce yourself. There we go. Uh, hey, good morning, everybody. <laughs> my name's Justin. Uh, Hi, Matt. It's good to see you. And and, and Sean, good to see you, uh, your face as well as Kyle. Um, I work at uh, Google on a COS operating system, which is uh, Google's container focused operating system that kind of underpins most of GKE as well as a bunch of their managed services. Um, and before that, I was the manager of the team that started Bottle Rocket at AWS. Very cool. Uh, one question: Are we? Do we record these? Are we? We are recording. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, I had a couple questions. Now I see that in the Zoom interface. Cool. Yeah. So uh, looks like no one else has joined in. I guess we can get on, on along with the agenda. Um, so main thing now is a uh, ball rocket presentation. Uh, Kyle will be driving that, and I'll, uh, a couple of us can jump in at any point if needed. Um, but I'll turn it over to you, Kyle. Oh, muted. Oh. Yeah. No. Okay. Can you see my presentation? Yep. Yep. Okay. And and I'm not on mute this time. Um, perfect. I think I toggled it on mute when it was already off. Um, okay. Well, I'm the senior developer advocate for Bottle Rocket. Uh, I work at AWS, and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I give a lot of these presentations about Bottle Rocket. Um, and the nice thing about this presentation is half of my presentations is just describing what like a special purpose operating system is. And this group should know. Um, and so it's it's kind of like coming with a starting point that I don't usually uh, get. Um, Sean will jump in here. Uh, and and frankly, other folks that are are have been involved with Bottle Rocket, I'd love to get feedback. Uh, if there's anything else, just kind of stop me as I, I prattle on a little bit. Um, okay, so let's just dive in and talk a little bit about the components of Bottle Rocket. Um, you know, Bottle Rocket starts from the bottom, with like, you know, just the Linux kernel. We use SystemD um, for kind of init and system services. Um, ContainerD is our container runtime, and Kubelet is the agent that we use uh, to join the Kubernetes clusters. And then on top of that, you have your pods. Uh, running your workloads. This looks 
pretty standard and unamazing to most people who have kind of looked at the components of an operating system. Um, but we have other things as the uh, illustration kind of in indicates that there is probably more here. Um, we have two separate instances of container D. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, you know, if your connection to your orchestrator is hosed, you still have the ability to kind of like log in and administer the, the node and maybe figure out what the problem is. Uh, and then that provides kind of like a reserve tank if you have resource constraints on on, um, on that, that you can still have that ability to administer the node and make changes um, from there. That container D supports host containers. We'll talk a little bit more about those in detail. Um, and then uh, on the other side of this, we have our API server. Uh, Bottle Rock is an API driven uh, operating system. And uh, the API server is only connected via, via privilege connection. Uh, so it's not publicly available. Um, and typically that works with the uh, host containers. Uh, there are patterns where you would use it with, with kind of workloads that are managed by your orchestrator if you explicitly give it access to that. So that's the overall kind of like interesting layer cake with a few unusual columns. But I think the one pe thing people ask most questions about is, you know, host containers, what are those and how do they come into it? It's kind of a unique concept. So uh, Bottle Rocket doesn't have a shell um, and it doesn't have an SSH server on the host. Um, so what do you do? How do you, if you want to interact with it, how do you do that? Um, you use a control container and um, uh, the control container basically uh, is where you would do that administration. And it, instead of using SSH, you uh, log in with uh, SSM session manager. Um, and that is interacting with the control container, um, which is running on the host. So you're not interacting directly with the host. Control container has a limited set of resources that it can access, one of those being the uh, Unix socket that supports the API client um, and a few other kind of uh, mapped resources underneath that. Um, the other thing it can do is that you can enable the admin container. Uh, the admin container uh, gives you much broader access to the host resources um, that uh, are on that. So you can kind of explore the full file system, the root file system, um, and do all sorts of other things. It does have the ability to have an SSH server. So if you include the right um, you know, SSH keys, you can log into the admin container through that. But that's not enabled by default. So uh, you'd have to get into the control container and then enable it. And then the SSH server would come up. Um, but even that's optional. So that's how you kind of get access to those host resources. Now, we need to shift gears a little bit and talk about the other kind of remarkable part. Um, not remarkable in that it's uh, amazing, uh, but remarkable in that it's something you should remark about. Um, Bottle Rocket uses the concept of variants. And variants are basically... Um, build time constructions for environments and software that we need to interact with. Um, so we identify them by the kind of file name that you would use to select them. Uh, so basically you would find the right bottom market variant for your use case, and then you would deploy that to the those instances or servers. Um, we kind of use this by concatenating a different bunch of different things together. The first thing you look at is the uh, platform. We support AWS, VMware, and bare metal. Um, and then, then we talk about the orchestrator. We support Kubernetes and ECS. And this is kind of interesting for a lot of folks when they start looking at this. Uh, we integrate the orchestrator version and we treat that as a distinct piece of software. So Kubernetes 1.25 uh, is a distinct piece of software from Bottle Rocket's perspective from 1.24. Um, of course, we have the architecture. We support x86-64 and ARM-64. And then finally, we have the Bottle Rocket version. Um, so this kind of informs that these are all built and, and provided. I think, Sean, we were talking about this yesterday. It's something like 25, 26 different variants per version that we produce. Um, so you find one of those that you would want for your specific instance that you want to operate. Um, Ball Rocket's API-driven operating system, um, meaning that uh, basically um, if you want to make changes to it, you're going to use an API. So in a typical operating system, you do something different. For example, if you want to change the max container log size, in a general purpose operating system, you would log in to the shell on the host and you make changes to some sort of like JSON file, for example. You'd have to know where that JSON file is, have to know how to change it, the settings you need to do. Similarly, if you want to change DNS, you would do the same type of process where you'd log in and find maybe an XML file, understand how to change that, and know what the rational settings are for it. 
Uh, Bottle Rocket eliminates all that. Of course, we don't have any SSH server or any way to log directly into the host. Um, so we provide an abstraction layer there through an API. So you would, uh, as a user wanting to administer it, make a change to the API through the API client built into the control container. Uh, that would, in turn, connect to the API server, which would change the underlying uh, configuration files in a way that's deterministic, and we can kind of track those changes in, in, in ways that make a lot of sense to the operating system. So if you want to roll something back, we know how to do that. Um, same thing for DNS, but it would make changes to the other type of you know underlying configuration file. Uh, what's important here, too, is um, you don't have to make those changes interactively. We have a thing called user data where you can take the TOML representation of the API commands uh, and basically put them right in. So when it boots, it reads that configuration information um, and makes those uh, API changes and configuration file changes uh, during boot. So you don't have to manually change everything when you want to launch it. Um, we mentioned this before, but Bottle Rocket has a little distinction in how we think about updates and things that are a little different than update. You can update in place uh, one version of Bottle Rocket to the next. So for example, moving from Bottle Rocket 114.3 to 115.0, it's just an update and you can automate that. Um, if you're looking at changing something more substantial, we consider that a migration. So as I indicated before, Kubernetes 128, or excuse me, Kubernetes uh, 124 to Kubernetes 125 will be considered a migration. And that's something you'd have to do manually. Um, from an automated perspective, we have a couple of different tools that help you do that. Uh, in a Kubernetes context, we have the affectionately named BrewPop, which stands for Bottle Rocket Update Operator. Uh, it really rolls off the tongue, unlike ECS Updater, which is very straightforward. It updates and kind of manages those updates for you. Um, if you want to do it manually, you can, of course, trigger an update through the API client, or you can do something like a node replacement, which is not unusual to Bottle Rocket. Um, that's where you drain the nodes, uh, replace those nodes, um, and with a newer version. And that would be the migration that we talked about with 124 Kubernetes to 125. Um, managed node groups work this way as well. So there's no right way to do this. Some people do in-place updates and some people do node replacement. It depends on their context. Um, immutability is a thing we get a lot of questions about. You hear people say Bottle Rocket is an immutable operating system, which it, it is. Primarily, uh, there are mutable parts of it. I think this is where people get confused. Of course, things like your container images, logs, um, things that would change in the course of an operating system's uh, lifespan, um, those are, of course, mutable. Um, if the mutable part is all your binaries, uh, anything that you would be, um, you know, that we would compile and put in that variant, uh, that's immutable. Um, and the way we do this, as far as updates are concerned, uh, we do kind of an A-B thing. So you're running root file system is on partition A. When you want to do an update, it downloads into partition B. And then on reboot, we just swap them. And then if you want to update to another version again, you would it would up, go into partition A and then we would swap them back. So that kind of A-B swap at boot um, provides a kind of clean cut between the two of them. So you kind of get that atomic cut over. Um, got a question in the chat. A, B partitioning is the way. I agree entirely. Um, so file system protections and, and chain of trust, um, the non-root file systems and the mutable part is protected by SE Linux. Um, and the root file system has uh, is immutable, uh, read-only, and it uses DM Verity. DM Verity, if you don't know, is actually a really interesting piece of software that uses cryptographic digests to uh, detect any changes on the block device itself. And if any change happens on that, uh, block device, it will trigger a reboot. So it it down to the bid level. Um, so that provides kind of a high degree of, of certainty that you know it no changes have been made uh, on the same thread, starting with 115.0 and our new variants. So anything that was introduced in 115.0 or forward, screw reboot is default, and that implements a chain of trust. So that's basically cryptographic verification from before boot, each step along the way in the boot process. So shim and grub and uh, all those things until the you know we get into the full-fledged user environment. Um, those are all um, uh, verified uh, cryptographically. So you have a high degree of understanding that what you intended to boot is what you booted. 
Um, as far as how we operate, it's Apache 2 and MIT license. Uh, we built in the open on GitHub. Um, so you can see all the uh, different movements of the project there uh, in GitHub. Um, as far as the environments we work in, the biggest one by far would be uh, AWS EC2 Kubernetes. Um, On-prem Kubernetes is probably number two. These are all relative. I mean, I, I don't have exact numbers. Exact numbers in open source is a challenge in general. Um, ECS is, is a pretty small number, but it is growing pretty pretty fast. Um, so those are implicitly on AWS as well. And then IoT and interactive devices. Uh, this is something that uh, the Bottle Rocket team at AWS doesn't work with very much. We do have another company that has forked Bottle Rocket and uses it pretty extensively in some of these um, uh, devices where you're not really connected kind of to the cloud as its um, as its first class way of operating. Um, they forked Bottle Rocket and they don't distribute it, and that's fine based on the the license. But they do contribute a lot to the community as far as like giving us feedback and um, you know uh, basically. Um, valuable input to the operating system. So uh, we think they're an important part of our community as well. Um, so pretty fascinating what they've done to laptops and uh, cameras and all sorts of interesting things. Um, we have bi-weekly community meetings on Zoom and Meetup. Um, and so um, you can join in with those, the, find the Meetup group and we post the Zoom every other week. And then you can of course go to bottlerocket.dev, which is our recently built uh, website. Um, Here's our GitHub, Bottle Rocket OS, slash Bottle Rocket, and BottleRocket.dev, where we have documentation, and we'll have some new stuff there um, over time. So questions. Yeah, Justin Hayes, so why did they fork? Uh, I think that's a good question. Um, one, I think that uh, the way Bottle Rocket's built right now, and Sean might dip into this right now, if you want to make very substantial changes, you kind of have to fork. Bottle Rocket to to make those changes and distribute those, um, but moving forward, one of the things that that the Bottle Rocket team is working a lot on is our out of tree build system. Um, in the future, they may not need to fork; they may just be able to create their new build without forking. Um, so, I I don't think it's a it's not a hostile fork for it by any means. So, so you know the answer. There you go. Uh, Sean, do you want to add anything about uh, out of tree builds because it's something I'm not hugely involved in. Um, yeah, I think that's the main thing is uh, with the way things are today, it's very easy to make your own customizations and do things, but but to store all of those different customizations in the main ball rocket repo is kind of a, ends up being a scalability issue. So this, uh, Kyle mentioned out of tree builds, that's, that's the name that we're calling this, uh, of making it so that file rocket itself is kind of like the core OS distro, it, and then for all these different types of variants, making it a lot easier for someone to just have their little piece that defines what that recipe is for the, the variant that they want and the customizations that they want on top of, of File Rocket itself. Um, so that's something that's being worked on now. Uh, and and our, our goal and, and our hope is once, once that's all in place, then it'll make it very easy for someone like this other company that has done this fork, that they wouldn't necessarily need to do that. And then they would be able to use this out of tree build system um, with the tools like, you know, there's a tool called Two Leader and, and some other pieces that come together to do this, where really they can keep that recipe wherever they want it. And they don't need to, to take the entire bottle rocket repo and fork it. They can, they can take, just combine bottle rocket with whatever else they're doing and produce their own variants and, and make it a lot easier than what it is today. Okay, so we got some other questions. Theo, did you did, did you have a, a question? I, I do have quite a few actually. Uh, thanks for the pre presentation. It's amazing. Uh, it's it's great work. I agree with a lot of the of the concepts that you've presented. Um, amazing stuff. Um, so my first first question would be: You said that most, if not all, of the management work on um, a bottle rocket node is done by a um, I forgot the name some some container uh, remote host control container, which is a control version container. of a host container. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, 
how generalized is that container? So you're basically, I, the way I see it, bottle rocket is just kernel and system D um, and just a very minor bit of user space tools. And how, how generalized is that container? Could it work on any or other um, um, specialized operating systems that are image based and somewhat work like bottle rocket does, or is it, does it contain too many assumptions uh, that are bottle rocket specific? Uh, that's that's a good question. As far as how generalized it is, if you look in our repo, you can actually look at it. It's um, it's not that extensive. It's it's kind of a small surface area. It's an Amazon Linux two container. Um, it has you know some bind mounts and a few other things like that. I think their assumptions are there, um, but I don't think it has. And and Sean might be able to dip in more here. I don't think it's hugely complex. Basically, it's just giving you access to a very few things that are bottle rocket specific. Um, so generalizing it to other container optimized operating systems, um, I mean, you could, but I think you would probably be just as well creating your own container. Oftentimes we have our own users that will replace the control container with something that they like. Right, so it's not a heavy lift to provide the same functionality. Um, so, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Sean, you, do you have anything to add? Yeah, if you if you distill it down, it really is just a container with some management tooling um, that's configured to have some bind mounts to access certain paths on the Bottle Rocket host OS itself. Um, I, I guess so my question. If those those uh, connections to the host operating system are there more or less generic? Is it standard D or um, kernel stuff, or is it more specific to the bottle rocket operating system? It's basically standard. We do mount um, the API client endpoint. Mm -hmm. So so Kyle had mentioned you can use this API to access the settings, make modifications. Um, so we do make sure that's mounted into the control container, uh, so that it makes it really easy. You connect to the control container, and you can you can make those changes and do do whatever you need to do. Beyond that, it's it's a really basic um, container. So yeah, you could swap in your own custom host container. Um, conceivably, you could make a control container that has whatever tooling is needed to run on either Bottle Rocket or whatever, wherever else you want to do it. If there's some type of universal control container concept. Uh, it's, that not, it's not as much about the container as about the operating system base. So I see kernel oh, system okay. and I'm familiar with that. So could I, you know, take away the, the Bottle Rocket base and put in some other base that also provides a kernel and a system D and then the, the upper layer would just work kind of as expected. In the container image itself, or in, in the in the operating system, uh, I I can jump in if you like. Sure. Um, I think the the big piece is actually the host container setup, and so like the the second container D is really what is actually like the container itself is not actually the important part. It's the container D and the kind of infrastructure around it, and that's what you're really getting with these host containers. And so, um. If you wanted to port this over to something else, you'd need to kind of think about that whole ecosystem of like having an API server that is accessible and you make these changes through this other second container D. And that's kind of what we're getting access to. The container itself is not really useful, right? It, it could be really what any container you want. It's the access that the the host container, like container D version has has provided mm -hmm. you. That's that's the important bit. And so if you were wanting to do a similar kind of system you'd need to have kind of that infrastructure built up behind it so, so, we so can basically, protect everything through there. basically a custom api server that then supports the other operating thanks that yeah. that exactly answers my question awesome yeah i think that 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 really nails it so the api is is the real key there it just it's it's a pathway to the api and if you had an api then yeah a, a generic control container would be totally possible can, can i um, jump the queue real quick yeah uh, to add something there well, when we were first building Bottle Rocket, we knew we needed some way of doing remote API access, right? Um, because how else can you touch the thing once it's running? 
Um, and we said, well, we don't want to build auth and transport for remote API access. That sounds hard. And we build operating systems. And so we looked around and there was SSM. And so we said, well, if we have SSM, we can send remote commands. They handle auth and transport for us. That seems pretty great. And so the control container was born really effectively to connect the uh, SSM uh, remote commands and sessions to uh, to the API server. And like, we're, we had a point when we built it that the SSM container or SSM agent could, could run in thinner and thinner places. Um, it, it assumes things like shells and stuff. So it, it landed in an AL2 container, but we would have loved for that to be even less uh, at the outset, but, but there's constraints around the tools that we had. Okay, we had a, a Demetrius, I think, has a question. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to understand how the API works. You, you said every action you want to take on, on, a, on a machine happens through the API. I think I understand that you are talking mostly about things that mutate the system. Uh, that sounds like, a, like a, a predefined list of things you can do. And for, for changes, that sounds sane. I mean, obviously, you don't want people to go and changing uh, arbitrary things. But what happens if you want to just read things? Like, for example, I have a thing I had today, for example. I, uh, one of my nodes in Kubernetes couldn't access uh, the other nodes. Uh, so I couldn't access kubedns. And I knew... I, I didn't know exactly where the problem was. So at that point, you start doing arbitrary things. So let's say you want to run a trace route command. Mm -hmm. So is the API a predefined list of commands you can run, or does it accommodate for arbitrary commands in some way? <clears throat> yeah, so the API is primarily for mutating system. Um, so what you would want to do, kind of that debugging, would be done either through the control or through the admin container. So um, as an example, if you're running the admin container, you have basically full access to the, all the root resources. Um, there's another level called Sheltie, which gives you uh, effectively root access. Um, so you would use the admin container or the control container, but most likely the admin container because you want kind of deeper access to that system um, to be able to do those debugging commands that you're talking about. The settings would not be very useful because they would just return back what you have set that value to uh, or be, let you change that. So um, th those would not be super useful for that. So there are a few other things, um, and actually Sean built um, something that that does like a reporting a on, part, on top of the API client, which will tell you if you you know meet versus a set of um, uh, specific um, benchmarks. So uh, there are some other things like that, but uh, that what you would want to do is probably use the admin container to kind of interactively debug. Okay, well, that gives you a cell then, okay. Yeah, Yeah, and just one other interesting thing about that is it gets you a shell, but that still that shell is running in the admin container. There, There is no shell on the host itself. It just mounts things up and, and makes it look like you're on the host um, because you have access and, and things just work the way you expect them to work. Um, but one of the interesting things then is in this admin container, it, it's it's a another Amazon Linux uh, base, you can install packages there, uh, which you wouldn't be able to do on the host OS itself. So if you needed some type of network debugging tool, you can actually get that installed on within the admin container and then you know do, do whatever deb debugging, troubleshooting you need to do. And in the meantime, you're not affecting what's actually part of the host itself that whole time. And then when you're done, you can disable that admin container and, and it's a container, it's gone. So you, you don't have to worry too much about, uh, oh, what did I, what I, what did I install on this host or what did I change on this host that now it's behaving differently than all my other hosts. It's, it's kind of contained <laughs> in the, in the admin container. Yeah. And, and I'll add something to, to what Sean said, something I, I kind of missed you can entirely disable control in admin containers. And we have lots of users who do. Uh, they don't want any, for security reasons, any interactive access, no way to mess with it. Um, so they turn them off. And there's ways to re-enable them by, you know, mounting a privileged container in the orchestrated host and then uh, running a few uh, few commands that way uh, to re-enable them. But um, 
that means that you have nothing running, right? Um, you know, Sean said kill the admin container, but you can even kill the control container and it's fine. Um, and yeah, Justin wrote about Sheltie. Um, Sheltie is a fantastic tool, but also is one that is the, the kind of the bane of my existence. Uh, everybody wants to get as high access as they want, as they, they, they're like, okay, I've talked to users that basically say, anytime I do anything with Bottle Rocket, I go to the control container, I enable the admin container and go right to Sheltie, um, which is which is kind of playing with fire um, a lot. So uh, we, we have talked a lot about like, you know, how do we address the dangers of, of somebody doing that? Because you can really hose your operating system pretty quickly uh, with Sheltie. But for those who need the power, it's there, right? You can, you can get pretty deep in, it seems like you're using the host itself. Um, and if you look at what Sheltie is, it's like two lines in a bash script. It's pretty crazy um, as far as is what it does. It, it's functionally just changing namespaces and a couple other things like that, if I recall, so. Even in that mode, your system stays immutable or, or not? Yes, it's immutable, yeah. So you cannot make changes to the host. Well, you can, and then all of a sudden you're rebooting because DM Verity caught you, right? So that's yeah. the the problem is that there are systems that will detect that, and then you're in trouble. But you, it will not persist through a reboot, right? I think yeah. it's the important important thing. You had a question, Justin? A uh, well, uh, I was going to ask a new question and change topics, but uh, I'll ask a follow up to that. There, like you mentioned that there are portions of the file system that are writable. And so what if I go in and mess with, right? I, I go manually configure in the, in the shell DNA, I manual, manually configure my DNS. Like DM Verity is not going to reboot me then, right? It's not, no. And and that's one of the reasons why it's so dangerous, right? Like the API expects certain things to work certain ways. And with Shelty, you can go in and make changes that it doesn't expect. And they persist or not in undefined ways. Um, so uh, it's not the right way to problem solve Bottle Rocket very often. Um, so it's kind of an anti-pattern, I, I think, to to really go in and, and use and jump to Sheltie first. Um, so that that's I, I you know kind of getting deep into it, but you can make those changes that are dangerous to your system, and you know, and then if you were to advisable. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to do something like change a kubelet.com file, um, because it's a configuration file that gets modified based on your settings, it is something that can conceivably be modified. Uh, but if that node were to reboot, that's all driven by the settings that you've set through the either the initialization with the user data, TOML information, or through the API. Um, so that that config file gets rewritten. It's not something that's persisted. That's meant to be modified um, by the settings. If someone were to get into the system somehow and try to swap out uh, like the the kubelet binary, that's something that's on that that read only file system, and that is something that would trigger that DM Verity where it would be you know it, it would. Yep, checksum doesn't match, something's corrupted, something's modified here, and it would reboot the node. And then, um, so you're kind of protected. It, it, it adds at least a layer of protection for for um, someone trying to slip something in. <laughs> Demetrius, you had another question? Yeah. Um, so uh, regarding the underlying OS, uh, actually, no, differently. Uh, what is the starting point for a, a Bottle Rocket user? So let's say I have an Edge device and that has some chip on it for for doing, I don't know, model training, whatever, something you haven't thought of when you build your artifacts. I assume your artifacts are image files, right? You, you build images that can be flashed on devices, right? So what um, what's the flexibility? What, what can the user do when they want to add something to the underlying system before it becomes immutable, but still staying immutable with that modification. So like bring your own image kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, basically you'd have to create your own variant at that point. Um, and, and that is a lot of maintenance. And I think as Sean mentioned with auto tree builds, that's some of the things it's trying to solve if you need to kind of add extra bits in there that wouldn't be uh, typically included. Um, Sean, do you want to add more to that? 
Yeah, I guess depending on the use case, what you're actually trying to do, the the one option I can think of, rather than going that full route of of creating your own uh, variant, uh, there's one more special host container that we didn't really touch on is a bootstrap container. <clears throat> and that's something that, that can run as the system is initializing <clears throat> before all the services are, are fully running. Um, so we have seen some people where you know maybe they'll they'll mount another uh, storage volume and then run some script in this bootstrap container that gets things set up how they need to. So um, you, you said you know learning models, you know maybe maybe they could it could mount a uh, storage device that has some ready data that that then whatever other container services they're running would be able to access that data and not have to you know start fresh and and do things so um it's kind of the, the bootstrap container is kind of a escape hatch for for anything that we're that you can't do through the api where you need to to make some type of modification or change so it can it gives you a little bit of flexibility to do special things like mounting volumes or, or uh, additional settings, things like that. But, but, but yeah. not, for example, like a, a custom kernel that supports uh, custom custom hardware, right? Like you have an NVIDIA board or something. So you would need to build ah. uh, your own variant in that case. Yeah. So what we, just to add, we do have to support NVIDIA variants. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's built in, but, uh, and you can load kernel modules. Um, there is ways to load kernel modules in. So, so you do have some of those settings that, that are there, but like putting in a custom kernel, that, that's like, you, I think you're in the range of doing something um, pretty extensive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. Justin? So, Thilo, uh, go ahead and jump in front of this. I just wanted to put a plug in for maybe a little bit of discussion about the build system because it's related to the the this out of tree build. It's related to sort of how variants are created, and I, I just I think it's kind of interesting and novel since it was built from from the ground up. <laughs> but uh, go ahead, Thilo, instead, and and if it's especially if it's still on topic, it it's it's more like a. It's not really a comment, but it's more like a comment than a question. Uh, and of course, we have the same pain with flat car because we're immutable. Um, and uh, there's always users that either want to remove most of the stuff that we ship or you know, put additional stuff on. That is a core functionality. And it's kind of hard to reconcile that in a base OS. Um, but I've noticed that you're using system D. And if you're using a, re mo a recent enough system D version, um, you will have uh, two tools called systemd sysx and um, systemd sysupdate on your base OS. Sysx manages uh, read-only operating system images, layers that can be layered on top of the existing OS. And we're actually explo uh, exploring it in Flatcar to extend or make, make it user extendable. Uh, for instance, we ship a uh, contribution, user contribution Kubernetes version as a sysx that can be applied because we don't ship kubelet in, uh, in Flatcar and stuff like that. Um, and I wonder if you've uh, explored those those possibilities because these are we find them extremely uh, fitting for our purposes. John, Matt, I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah I don't I'm, believe we have. I don't know, Matt. If you... uh, yeah. So um, Ben Cressy is the principal engineer that also does a lot of these kind of cool explorations, and him and I chat about this. He didn't make it today, but. Um, he did look at them some and, and we chatted about them. They are interesting. Um, they they may work for what we want. They may not. I guess it's one of those that like, I guess it'd be really interesting to hear how Flatcar um, finds them to work because they could solve some of those problems. I think getting back to kind of uh, dovetail what Justin said, we've kind of taken a different approach of like, let's make it really great to develop your own variant um and and build your own version and so like the bottle rocket os is definitely the thing that people think about but in my mind i also think about like the bottle rocket build system as like yet another thing that people should be excited to use and and build and so i think we're shifting maybe towards more of making it really great and easy for people to just customize what they want and build that custom version that has exactly the slicing and dicing of what they want um and make it easy and maintainable for them so they can still get all the benefits from our upstream like core os 
but they can have their version of Botarka just like they like it. Um, and so we've been investing more on like the, how do you build a nice custom image versus how do you layer in just in time at the like the, the run level? So that's, I guess, our approach, but I think there maybe is room for both too. So I, it's, and I think that's a good topic that we could probably keep bringing up in this, this room. Cause I think that's absolutely one of the big things that is interesting to us. Definitely. Would you folks want an intro to physics, like a general, uh, general intro to physics in the next session? Cause I, I volunteer for that. That would be, be nice. Interested. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. We'll do. By the way, we do use it in cars as well. So <laughs> you may want to look it up. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's actually kind of an interesting uh, non-technical and more philosophical or like not philosophical, but but kind of distro philosophy or tenets question, at least in my head, it, it is right. Like kind of what, how, how rigid or flexible should your container focus special purpose distro be to accommodate kind of these different use cases and at what layer should it have that flexibility, right? Like it, it, it doesn't seem wrong to say, no, my thing doesn't ever run Docker. It only runs container D and it only runs orchestrated containers. Um, and and it does it really well. And, and you limit yourself to that, that audience. And then you can also say, well, no, we have these other use cases. And so we need to provide this, you know, amount of customization at runtime or at build time or, at some other later position in in time, and I think that's just kind of an interesting an interesting struggle. We're, we've been thinking through some of this with with costs lately for for similar reasons, right? Um, uh, yeah, sort of the I think establishing the like the the core kind of tenet of the operating system that you're either adhering to or violating when making those choices is is I think the hard part. <laughs> and then the the technological pieces, there's a bunch of different routes. That's a really important part. I think, you know, I hear a lot people say, I love what Bottle Rocket's doing. I love the engineering behind it. It makes a lot of sense to me, but I want to do this thing that violates all the principles that were set up, right? Like I, I want to embed deeply some sort of, you know, um, uh, specialized kernel that does some sort of like, you know, evaluation for security purposes or whatever. And at the same time, you're saying, you know, what we're trying to do is prevent this arbitrary code from running um, that that kind of violates the entire idea. So it's a difficult thing because you want to enable users, right? You want people who have requirements for that particular piece of code to be able to do it. But at the same time, you have to kind of balance like the purpose of what you're doing. Because if you take everything away from it, is it still bottle rocket? Is it still flat car? Is it still cost? Once you start pulling it apart, right? It, it just ends up becoming something that it's not. Um, and, and so a lot of times from our perspective, what we talked about with users is like, what, what's your purpose in doing these things? Um, and is it even needed? You know, oftentimes security agents or whatever, when you say you're immutable and you can't make these changes, the need for that kind of goes away. And so um, it's, it's more of a philosophical discussion with the people who want to use it. Um, so, it's it's an ongoing struggle um, to kind of maintain those those two values at once. Practically, from what we've seen in, in Kairos, at least uh, one of the reasons people want to have um, um, how to say that options uh, when it comes to the underlying OS is not always because they want to run another kernel or something uh, weird like that. Let's say, but. Sometimes it's something simpler, like the board, for example, support from whatever company, right? Uh, and they're paying for that, and they want to still get that support. Let's say you have a, uh, like you have a contract, and you are you expect to get security updates very quickly from the company you are paying. They need to have a way to provide that. So the only reason sometimes they want to be able to control the underlying OS is just for that, that they keep their support. The other one we've seen uh, is that they have knowledge. So, you know, companies have preferences. Uh, for some reason, for example, I, I can't even understand Alpine most of the time, uh, but many, many people love it. And it, it's a general thing in, in their company and their group and their project. So generally speaking, they, they want to stick to that because that's what they have knowledge uh, own and, and uh, experience and that's another reason we've seen so sometimes the practical reasons are, are not 
you know, something you cannot work around. And I think it's up philosophically, it's up to the project to decide what problem it solves, because it may not want to solve you the your contract and support problem. It may want to, to solve your security problem. So the moment you decide to jump to a new project like Bottle Rocket, you also take the decision to get support for that OS. Go find someone that sells that, but that, that's what you get. So I, I think it's just a decision in the beginning what kind of problem you're solving, right? That's why I think, I mean, all of us are working on projects that in some degree look similar, but they're not solving the exact same problem. So I think there is still room to choose and to pick because each project focuses maybe on some different things or maybe focuses more on something than something else. Uh, yeah, well put, well put. All right, uh, by the way, uh, Tilo suggested a presentation. I'm not sure how we do that. We just write it to the agenda and it's yeah. booked already. I, mm -hmm. I just wrote it. Um, so it's a 10 minute thing. Uh, the um, like the beauty of, of SysX and systemd sys update, which plays along with it uh, and solves the update issue, um, is that it is extremely simple. Like you can explain it in three or four slides. Uh, Dimitris, would you be around on uh, November 2nd and cover? Oh, why am I the only one lost here? No, no. test, test. No, okay. Ah. For, for what it's worth, I'm more than happy to push uh, like, the bottom uh, of the top. Um, Kairos, hmm. use of. So, One sec, you, we lost you for a while and didn't hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. A bit from where you said if I'm available at the second, I think you said of November. <laughs> um, if you if you're available on the second of November, I would like to hear a lot about um, Kairos use of of uh, of Sysx, If you could uh, prepare one or two slides. Uh, we have a presentation. I don't remember if that's the date. Did, did you check? We're presenting Kairos. No, 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 uh, not, not 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 an info to Kairos, but uh, uh, just and, and yeah, it's it's open source's term uh, early November, but uh, I wanna I wanna intro SysX in general, um, and I might have like one and a half slides on how Flatcar uses SysX, but that's more like an appendix. I wanna you know get you interested mm -hmm. in a general idea because we from the Flatcar team uh, uh, we we love it and we think it's amazing and we think it should see more uh, adoption. So that's my my motivation here. And so if if Kairos uses it as well, I would love to hear about it. Like one or two mm -hmm. slides, would you be available? Uh, I'm not the expert on CSX, but I can show you what we are doing. Either me or someone else from my team. Let me check my calendar. W what day is that? But we can do That's it offline uh, in, in chat. Second of, November, second of November, same time. Yeah, yeah. Thursday. So it's always the same hour, right? Uh, my right. 5 p.m. Yeah, I, I should be able to either me or someone from my team. But uh, yeah, I, I can do that. Awesome. I'll, I'll just add it to the... Mm -hmm. And I'll take a note. Because I tend to forget. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else anyone wants to talk about today? Well, we do have uh, an upcoming schedule of some demos like this, uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, next week, our, our next meeting uh, is OpenSUSE MicroOS, um, and then uh, a few more to follow. Um, so definitely join us for those. Uh, and anything else like the, this topic uh, with System D, if we want to add that uh, to future agendas, please just go in the agenda doc and, and add any topics that you want to cover. And uh, thanks for whoever took the notes today. That's that's awesome. That's I always don't think about that until it's like halfway through and then realize, oh shoot, should be writing some of this down. Uh, So, uh, awesome. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah. See you soon. Thanks for yeah, doing it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Thank everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.